It is a great, great pleasure to be here today. And in, interestingly, I think I'm going to be talking almost as much about the audience as I am about my own research because there's several folks in the audience who have substantively contributed to this talk and I'll try and point them out as we, as we go along. But also, I hope to represent the university as a whole because the university is a very, very, very special place. Not just because we're Texas, although we are, um, but because of all the different threads that come together in a university. Research, education, philanthropy, you know, all of these things happen here and hopefully my talk in a little way will show you something about this. Even from the title you might guess this is coming. Point of care diagnostics and DNA computers and below I write, seriously? How can you put these two things together in a way that makes sense? Now while I can't promise that they'll make sense, I am going to do my very, very best. Our story actually starts in a very odd place, which is how does a woman know if she's pregnant? And in the old days, even prior to, to my birth, there was this notion that if you injected uh, fluid into a rabbit, you could tell if the rabbit died. And this was actually popularized on a 1952 episode of I Love Lucy because you couldn't actually say pregnancy on the air in those days. So they, they, they instead had a phone call in which Lucy yelled that the rabbit died. Now, this was actually a legitimate medical test in the old days. Um, but it sort of is a starting point from where we've gone since then because, of course, the reason that rabbits were responsive to fluids from pregnant women was because women were starting to produce hormones, uh, human chorionic gonadotrophin, in fact. And this goes up after pregnancy, it is, and it can be detected in part by the, the effect on the rabbit's ovaries, but there are better ways to do this. And in fact, if rabbits can do it, certainly you know, as humans we must be able to do it. And one of those better ways to do it was figured out by one of our audience members today, who is Ian Richards, who gracefully sent me a picture here, and who I've not known for that long, but who actually has been quite inspirational to me, even in the very short time I've known him. Because Ian was one of the inventors, as you'll see, of the early pregnancy test kits that we use today. And it was only because of a nexus of biological technologies, monoclonal antibody technology, material science, which, which Ian mastered almost effortlessly, and as we'll see, social forces that led to this innovation. But really, at the center of those forces was Ian himself marshalling all of the different issues of the day and taking a very, very complex task, which was complex not just technologically but also socially, and making it, in the end, quite simple. And so what Ian, in essence, did was take an old-style pregnancy test kit where you had to somehow obtain a cup full of urine and break it down to be a simple stick, a simple what we would call lateral flow device. And this is much harder than it looks because each step of this had to be engineered. How the absorbance works, how the flow works, what reagents you use, how well the reagents work, how well the reagents do or do not stick to the background. This was a huge engineering task. But again, because Ian solved these problems, we have today relatively simple, relatively straightforward ways to look at pregnancy very, very early on. And so this is a consumer product. It's, it's something that, that, that Ian can and should and I know is very proud of. But it also sort of leads to the point of this talk. My point of the talk is, is not to talk about, uh, about Ian's great work, although I'm, I'm again, excited that he, he let me um, sort of have a piece of his history to talk about, although you should talk with him for, for further details because he's, he's an amazing uh, gentleman who, who has the knowing of things, as it were. But if we can measure HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin, easily, why can't we and why don't we measure lots of other things in a similar manner? And I think that the answer is partly technological, and I'll talk about the technology part of it, but there are other answers. And one answer is that we sort of do this, right? We, we have test kits now for football players and band players and, and, and whatnot where we can measure, measure drugs of abuse. There are, in fact, point of care test kits for at least some pathogens that can be used. And so this, this is possible, but it's never really caught on. In the morning, you do not get up and spit on a stick for the most part. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't to monitor any of a variety of healthcare issues or to basically give yourself an idea of what your healthcare status was. And we'll get to that in a bit. But again, what Ian and my conversations with him reminded me was that at the time the pregnancy test kit was being developed, there was a social revolution going on in parallel 
with the scientific one. And so really, again, if you go back to these old episodes of I Love Lucy, and you even go back to just the, the climate of the day, we actually go from women not being trusted to make decisions, that, that a doctor should, should, should tell you whether you're pregnant, to first this. This was an ad circa 1976. And you can see this woman is, is sort of happy to figure out whether or not she's pregnant. But, but again, I, I let the ad speak for itself in terms of, of whether she seems very empowered or not. But within a few years, within only a few years, we're seeing ads like this, where now it has become commonplace for a consumer to take charge of her healthcare status. And so this was a revolution partially enabled, technically partially enabled socially, and it's something that at least I need to keep in mind as we segue. Um, so we're going to now leave pregnancy test kits and Ian Richards' awesome contributions behind and move towards a quite different revolution. So this is a huge problem today, the, 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 the arise and spread of multidrug resistant tuberculosis where um, in some companies, some co countries, sorry, the, the, you have upwards of 20, 25%, even 30% of the total tuberculosis cases are drug resistant, which means to a first approximation at this point, untreatable, or at least if you use a standard treatment, it's going to, only going to lead to the further spread of drug resistant tuberculosis. Now, this, this hits, it's close to home because I worked at Mass General Hospital for a number of years. Um, and one day I go in to have my regular yearly screening and lo and behold, I'm TB positive. And you know, I went through a course of treatment with isoniazid. Um, I'm presumably fine now, I don't have lesions, I'm not communicable, but, but nonetheless, this is not a, just a third world disease. This is something that impacts us all. Now, here's a different woman who was taking part in a different revolution. This is a former undergraduate of mine, Grace Eckhoff. And unlike other undergraduates who would follow doctors and who would spend their summers trying to figure out what research they wanted to do, Grace spent her summers in Afghanistan monitoring drug-resistant tuberculosis. Now, her parents were with an organization that was not unlike Doctors Without Borders, so Grace had an in. But Grace was also, I would like to say, a very special person, and is, remains, a very special person. And again, this is one of the things I brought up at the outset, how so many different paths cross here at the university. It was just a joy for me to be able to work with Grace. And to this day, she represents some of what is in the, to my mind, the best of what we can be. And she was and is an inspiration to me. Um, we learn as much from our students, I think, as they learn from us. So here is what Grace would send home after trekking the dusty trails in Afghanistan and after getting, going through endless reams of bureaucracy with the Afghan Ministry of Public Health would be sputum slides. Now these were fixed, they did not contain communicable TB, but nonetheless Grace would send them back to us and we would try and figure out whether or not they had a particular allele of drug-resistant tuberculosis, a particular mutation that led to a particular type of drug-resistant tuberculosis. And even with a lot of hard work, Grace was only able to gather a certain number of slides from a certain number of provinces and show something about the incidence of cases. So, you know, this was a very beautiful study for an undergraduate, but really what it was, I think, was very frustrating for Grace, and I, I began to feel her frustration. I, it wasn't something I'd really thought about before, I'll be honest. Well, I, you know, spent most of my days in academic contemplation and still, for the most part, do. But seeing Grace and seeing how she worked on this project, led me to think about, well, what is it that we can do? And so now we're about to segue wildly again, just to you know, keep your seat belts on, as it were. We've gone from pregnancy tests of convenience to really literally life or death decisions where medical care is sparse. But the life or death decision is being made months and months and months after the fact. She had to send the slides back to us. Her frustration was, why can't I tell you, here and now, today, whether or not you have drug-resistant tuberculosis or not, and help guide your treatment? Now here's the segue that's even more jarring than the previous one. As an academic, as a, as a good pointy-headed academic at the University of Texas at Austin, I just was amused by all sorts of things. And one of the things I was amused by was a nascent new field, DNA computation, that was really you know, engendered by these three individuals. I, as with almost all academics, I stand on the shoulders of giants, but these ones are still alive and I'm in awe of them. So Eric Winfrey, we're actually trying to recruit here, and so hopefully we get a chance to have Eric as a colleague because he's a genius, not just because I say so, but because the MacArthur Foundation says so, and he's just an extraordinary individual who has helped invent wholeheartedly the, the, the field of DNA computation. Niles Pierce and Peng Yin are respectively at Caltech and Harvard, and they also were instrumental in inventing this new field, which essentially says we can carry out computations not just with silicon and electrons, but with nucleic acids, with DNA molecules, like the ones that reside in you. 
but we're not going to use the ones that reside in you the way you use them. We're not going to play out some genetic program. We're going to build our own programs. And a couple of little programs are up there to the side. And I'm going to show you a program in just a, middle, in just a minute to give you a better idea of what I mean here. But now segueing back. Here's Grace, back from Afghanistan, frustrated in, in her own very sweet and polite way. I also had an extraordinarily brilliant graduate student, Zi Chen, um, who still is with me for a few more months and then is, is off to Harvard as a fellow. Um, but Zi was brilliant and driven, and Grace was brilliant and compassionate. And incidentally, this is why you go to the University of Texas at Austin rather than the University of Phoenix online. This is what a university is. The intersection of these remarkable people who somehow seed one another's ideas. And so Grace's frustration, ma frustration met with Z's brilliance to try and come up with a test kit that didn't need to be refrigerated, didn't require some complex instrumentation, didn't require some huge logistics train, some supply train, but could be implemented in the field. And this is what they came up with. It is a DNA computation. There are no enzymes involved here that via what we call strand exchange reactions, which again, I'll, I'll show you in just a minute, um, lead to something being blue or not blue. All right, it's as easy to read out as a pregnancy test kit. Now, it's a little more complex right now, and we're going to talk about how we're simplifying it towards being like a pregnancy test kit, but it is designed to tell you, do you have drug-resistant tuberculosis or not? And so this was a huge achievement of Grace's. It really was. And she's now off in England being a Marshall Scholar and doing quite well for herself, and Z will soon be off. And, and I, you know, I thank them both for this opportunity, except for one thing. It's not nearly sensitive enough. You'd literally almost have to be made of tuberculosis for this test to work. So we have a ways to go here. And this is where now we do talk about what do you mean by DNA computation? What is it that you're trying to do with the DNA molecules and the movement and the what? And so this is a reaction we call catalyzed hairpin assembly. Now, each one of those things looks like a hairpin, more or less. And their DNA, and I'm not even writing down G's and C's and A's and T's. These are just two molecules of DNA, and now in our drama comes a third player, the green molecule. Now, the green molecule is the catalyst. It is what we want to detect. It is drug-resistant tuberculosis. It is an allele that says, I am a tuberculosis bacteria that can carry, carries a particular mutation. And we have designed the other two characters to interact with the green molecule. But here's the interesting part. Once H1 here begins to interact, we have an unfolding. We have a strand exchange reaction, something very unique to DNA, incidentally. The G's and C's pair and unpair. The A's and T's pair and unpair. And we have a unfolding of the first molecule, which then reveals a piece of itself that can interact with the second molecule, which then unfolds and displaces green. So overall, what's happened? Green has led to two of these hairpins being put together and has been recycled. It is a catalyst. If you have many, many hairpins, green can go around the loop many times to create this double-stranded H1, H2 molecule at the end. And I think that that's pretty obvious. Now, the work that went into this, the engineering, how you actually do this, again, is the province of truly bright people like, like Z and Grace. But I think you can see this is an amplification reaction that detects green. And because of sequence specificity, we could tell the difference between drug-resistant and non-drug-resistant tuberculosis. Now, we tried to do a little better than the blue, not blue tube for somebody made of tuberculosis. And we hooked this up to various analytical reactions. We hooked it up to fluorescence reactions. We hooked it up to electrochemical reactions. And in the, way, in the end, we got about a hundred-fold amplification of signals. So now you only have to be one one-hundredth made of tuberculosis. But that's still not good enough. So we began to think, if this is really like a computer program or like a circuit, then we should be able to take one layer, one set of hairpins shown there at the top, and stack them. We'll have one layer feed to the next, and that layer feed to the next, and we'll get a hundred-fold amplification out of each one, and in the end, we will have a million-fold amplification, and that will be almost good enough for what we need to do in the field. Unfortunately, this is not how science works. You don't have a brilliant idea and go into the lab and have it work the next day. So this is the part where, <laughs> this is the part where you have to sit through a little bit the real science the grunt science, the, the part where we have to really make things work. So the first thing these guys found is they went and they did a simulation. They said, you know what? While it should work this way, every now and again a molecule unfolds, on itself, uh, unfolds by itself. It doesn't need the green thing. It doesn't need the catalyst. And so we have background. And they were able to show that both theoretically and they were able to show that um, experimentally. 
And one of the reasons things unfolded randomly and caused initiation of the cascade randomly was because they weren't pure enough. They didn't fold the right way. They didn't assemble the right way. And so what Z did was he went through and painstakingly isolated molecules that should be folded correctly, which are those two red boxes that he cut out from what's called an, a, a, a gel. And later on, he then pulled out only those molecules that should interact correctly. So again, we're purifying away impurities. And what that leads to there in the bottom, I forgot I brought my own laser point, um, is a very low background reaction. This is what we like to see in science is you don't work if you don't add the thing, and you do work if you do add the thing. We're, we're pretty simple people. And so this now works much better. In fact, we're up to the point where we get about a thousand-fold amplification of that green signal. So now you only have to be made one one-thousandth of TB in order to get a signal. We're actually getting someplace with this. However, you can guess, still not good enough. All right, but again, this is science we, we, we trundle on. And so Z recently, these are actually relatively recent results, realized that the reason the things were misfolding in the first place was because they weren't right. So we get these molecules chemically synthesized. And every now and again during chemical synthesis, there's a mistake. It's a very tiny mistake. I mean, but it is still a mistake. It's just as every time you replicate, there's a bit of a mistake. That's where cancer comes from. That's why your children aren't, the, aren't clones of you um, to a first approximation. So Z tried to figure out a way where he could make the DNA much more clonal, much more pure at the level of individual sequence. And he came up with doing enzymatic synthesis using enzymes to make the DNA rather than chemical synthesis, which is sort of inherently messy. And in so doing, he actually came up with a very good scheme for enzymatic synthesis. And we were worried for a minute that because we were doing this, we were going to actually price ourselves out of the market. But G did also did an excellent market analysis and says that we should still be down to a cost per reaction of around five cents. Now that sounds cheap to us. That actually is pushing the limit for some resource poor economies. So we, we need to do better still, but still we're on track to make better pure amplifiers. And again, we've got another 10-fold out of this. Z now has this really quite brilliant amplifier that does 10,000-fold amplification of initial signal. So now you only have to be one ten-thousandth made of tuberculosis. And now that's getting down to much more reasonable levels. However, still, we have a great idea. Really, it's, it was a great idea. It was the confluence of these two wonderful individuals who happened to have two different problems. Z, aggressively pursuing DNA computation. Grace, aggressively wishing to deal with a world problem. And so their idea was to make non-enzymatic amplifiers that recognize sequence. Except initially, they got virtually no amplification. But then Z went to work to make a different mousetrap, and he got a hundredfold amplification. And then he stacked the mousetraps, a somewhat painful analogy, and he got a thousandfold amplification. And then when he optimized the preparation of DNA, he got 10,000-fold amplification. And this was getting really exciting. And you know what comes next here. Still not good enough, all right? Uh, yes, 10,000-fold is great. But it is not where we need to be for point-of-care diagnostics. Although we do think we're now going to be able to do a million-fold or better, so we're on track. So we continue to try and tell the funding agencies that we have promised point-of-care diagnostics to that actually we're, we're ahead of schedule and we will get to um, non-enzymatic amplifiers that can produce signal in the presence of very low concentrations of a drug-resistant bacterium. Here's one of my mottos. When light gives you lemonades, the heck with lemonade, you cheat. Um, <laughs> so again, we're trying to achieve something here. We're not, we're not playing by the rules. We want to cause you know, people elsewhere to have better lives. And so we decided to back off on our enzyme-free philosophy and to use enzymes, but in a convenient format, something called LAMP, which I'll show you in a minute, which, if anything, is more complex than anything I've shown you so far. So if you were confused before, don't even go there. All right, but basically this, this, this is amplification with a thermostable DNA polymerase. It's an incredibly high amplification efficiency, a billion to 10 billion fold in 15 to 60 minutes, and there's high specificity. Now, this was carried out by two very experienced and talented postdocs in my lab, Bingling Lee and Sanchita Badra. So Chita working with Assurigen's ERI team. So now I must digress just a second. ERI stands for the Entrepreneurial Research Initiative, which again falls under, under Skip's aegis. And so you know all, all, all honor due to Skip for helping us with this. But what it is is, you may, have, may or may not have heard of the university's freshman research initiative, where we take undergraduates even from their first days on campus and we introduce them to independent research. We train new cadres of researchers from their very first day. 
That's very unique. That's very Texas. And it, again, it's one of the reasons that you go to the University of Texas at Austin rather than to the University of Phoenix at online. But in addition to that, we want our students to know not just how to do research, but what to do with it. And so uh, as a follow-on to the freshman research initiative, we started the entrepreneurial research initiative, which pairs students with local or not even non-local businesses. We actually have an ERMI member here, Brad Hall, who has his own ERI stream, um, different than Assurgeons. But they take these students that have been trained up in the freshman research initiative and begin to use them for applied projects. So this was actually an applied project carried out by two of my postdocs and by students who were part of this, pro who were part of this program. So here's the complex diagram I was promising you. Um, LAMP is very, very complex. It's an amplification scheme that eventually leads to long concatenators, long stringy things. Now these long stringy things are actually hard to find and hard to detect. It's like, well, you've gone from being not long and stringy to long and stringy. How do I look at that? Um, you can run gels. You can separate by size. But the long stringy things also have single stranded regions at the end. Now, you know, again, to our mind, these look a lot like the little piece of green that we used at the outset, and so we adapted them to our DNA computation. We cheated. We used enzymes to make a long stringy thing that billions of fold amplified the initial signal, but then we took a little piece of it that was still reminiscent of are you a drug resistant bacteria or not, and we transduced it into our DNA computer, and it works. So this is actually how you would try and detect it without our computer. You're trying to say, well, am I making more of this gamish on the gel here? And again, it's quite powerful. You can detect down to below 10 molecules of an individual bacteria. But it's too powerful. It actually wants to amplify most everything in sight. Now, it's not ac amplifying it accurately. It's not actually amplifying a bacteria. But even if you don't give it a bacteria, it tries to make something. It's, it's a very, it's, this polymerase is a real trier. It, it wants to please you. But here's the wrong reaction without the bacteria. And you know it's just muck. Here's the right one. It produces bands. But I don't want to run a gel every time I want to see if I've made the right thing or not. Instead, we have our transducer, the thing that recognizes the single strand region and says, are you from a drug resistant bacteria? Are you not from a drug resistant bacteria? And here is the difference. Both of these produce this gamish, this muck. But the muck that's, that's made without a bacteria, without a bacterial piece of DNA, is down here. And here's the correct stuff. Here's the stuff that was seeded properly. Our transducer, our computer, has worked out at the molecular level, not the problem of amplification, but the problem of what exactly got amplified. And so now we can tell signal from noise. Now, I started out talking about paper, and it got lost someplace along the way. We will now bring paper back. Um, these were all reactions that we had to work out in a test tube. And again, this is the, this is the, this is the gory part of science, the day-to-day -day crunch of, that didn't work. That didn't work. No, that didn't work either. Well, that didn't work. Tomorrow? No, nope, didn't work. Um, but you have these minor victories from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 folds. You have these great people that you, that you work with, and eventually you just cheat and make it work. Um, <laughs> but Peter here said, well, we still need to put this on paper. And so he took our strand displacement reactions, and he began to show that we could capture the sequences on paper. We could make something that, still ugly, looked a little bit more like a pregnancy test kit. And then we took the cheaty version of the reaction, where the enzyme informed the DNA computer about whether something had truly been amplified or whether it was just weird background muck. And he is now detecting down to about 1,000 molecules of sequence input. So we've gone a long way, partially by cheating and partially by being smart about how we're going to adapt reactions to a paper format to being able to see at realistic field levels the amount of DNA we need to see specifically so that we can tell whether someone has drug-resistant tuberculosis or not. OK. So now, and, and as, I can, as I say here, you know, that'll do enzyme, that'll do that. It really did finally get us over the hump. But that's not the last challenge. The next challenge, the challenge we still must deal with, is how do we detect multiple mutations in parallel? You can be resistant to rifampicin or isoniazid, which I took, or streptomycin or, or butyl or so forth. And they're all different mutations. And we have to have a probe, a way to detect each one. And we have to be able to do this in a multiplex format on a piece of paper. Whew. Well, fortunately, there are many people in this world that are much smarter than I am. One of them is George Whitesides, who's at Harvard. Um, and George made a paper platform where you could detect multiple different things at the same time. These spots indicate actually glucose and protein in urine, but you can see you have different concentrations, and George can make these even more complex as necessary. But we have clever people here at the University of Texas as well. And so this is my colleague, Dick Crooks, 
and Dick had a better idea. This thing is put together with quite, almost quite literally spit and glue. It's actually put together with two-sided tape. And so that's cool for demonstration purposes, but not for putting something in the field. You can imagine every test kit being handcrafted with two-sided tape. Dick said, well, why don't we just fold it up? And so Dick prints, Dick and his group, part of whom are here, um, print larger devices. And then the flow in the devices is determined by this beautiful layering that is determined by the fold of the paper. And so he makes the similar sort of multiplex devices by folding of a single piece of paper. So now, now you know, previously what I said was, well, we're adapting these different technologies. First we had, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We have people who do DNA computation. We adapt their work. We get as far as we can, and we're going farther, but we also adapt this enzyme work. And now we're adapting this as well. Again, it's only at the confluence of all these amazing people with their amazing ideas that this can happen. And so here we are building out paper strips that now use our reaction on their paper. And Karen is here today. I finally found a picture of her about an hour ago, fortunately. I didn't, I didn't know she was going to be in the audience, but you can talk to Karen about how this has worked. And the, the Crooks Lab is now going farther to do mass scale printing of this using uh, a wax printer that costs about $700. So you can begin to see how you might be able to implement paper-based reactions in a large-scale way using our, if I dare say, clever molecules plus their clever paper in a way that you begin to see might scale towards doing in vitro diagnostics. So this is the future, we believe, of in vitro diagnostics, of point of care diagnostics, is to make these and be able to go from blood or urine or spit or sputum and detect at very low levels sequences in those with drug-resistant tuberculosis just being the starting point for the possibility of detection of a variety of diseases. Now, I think this is really important. And it's not just really important because it's my idea. Ooh. It's really important because there's a driver here, and many people have recognized the driver. George Whitesides at Harvard, I should point out, you know, again, standing on the shoulders of, of, of true giants in our field, um, pointed this out probably first and best. And that is, if we can deliver paper, we can deliver healthcare. Because you know what's penetrant in this world? Cell phones. Everybody has a cell phone. You go into the back of beyond, and folks have cell phones, and they have cell phones with cameras. And so if you have a line or two lines or a bunch of spots, you can take a picture of them, and you can send that picture places. And again, horrifyingly, India has more cell phones than it has toilets. I mean, this is the sort of thing where we know that we're up against a huge problem in terms of healthcare. And so we can't be making magic boxes and complex solutions that require refrigeration. That's why we went with paper. That's why I put up with all of the pain of trying to make these reactions work and to get them onto paper was because I knew it was the only solution that made any sense to me to be delivered into resource poor settings. And I knew that once it got there, what had preceded me, what had preceded this device was electronics that could begin to give the information back to healthcare providers or others. But I really think it's even bigger than that, if you will, will bear with me for just a moment, because it impacts us here at home too. Think about the problem of what I, what I call nominally complex system diagnostics. Here we go. This is what I wake up with in the morning, and this is frequently what happens, right? So I, I boot my computer, and I've downloaded a virus, or the software has changed, or whatever. I get the blue screen of death, and credit doesn't work. Now, in the old days, this is what I did. I took it in to be serviced. Now, in the new era, what you can often do, although not with the blue screen of death, is you can interface with folks who will help fix your computer, even from afar. Um, my wife and I had a very wonderful evening one, one time talking with folks who were in the middle of their day in India trying to get our computer fixed. So, but again, you also almost don't even need the call center. You, you're, we're, we're to the point of, of, in many cases, automated fixing. So this is how complex system diagnostics is worth with electronics as we've moved forward. Okay, we're a complex system. How do we do diagnostics? Well, this is what we'd like to see, this is what we frequently see, and this is what we do reminds me of what I used to do with my computer. So how have we improved in advance today? Well, a little bit, but we still take our kids to see the doctor. And we take our kids to see the doctor because we trust the doctor, just like we trusted the doctor to tell us the rabbit died. And so basically, this is our paradigm. This is what we do. This is what we use. And I'm not saying it's a bad paradigm. I use it. This is what we do. But could we come up with a different one? What if we could just log on to get our health care? What if, just like I envision for folks who I've never met and never will meet, that they'll be able to take some piece of paper that I made and take a picture of it and say something about whether they have drug-resistant tuberculosis? What if I could take a piece of paper and take a picture of it and say whether or not my kid had influenza? Why not? And so what will enable this, I believe, is 
the ability to have online communities dedicated to health. And so this is one particular one. It's local. It's called TraitWise. And for full disclosure, I own about $10.52 worth of this company. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's a great startup, but it's not exactly making tons of money. It's a, it's a great company, though, because basically what it does is it asks you. It just questions you incessantly about your healthcare status and about a variety of other things. And it was developed by gamers, so it's actually really a lot of fun to use. In fact, they say that they have a, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 totally addicted people who are answering their, 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 que their questions, and this is growing daily. So it's actually quite an addictive interface for those of you who want such a thing. And we, it's not like we don't have competitors. There's a lot of people in this space. You've got 23andMe, patients like me, Google Health. We think our way is superior in at least one aspect. We have incredibly good statistical packages. And so this is, we were able to do correlations between questions. You answer yes to one and no to another, and so do 50 or 60 or 20 other people, and you get these correlations. And so, you know, sometimes these correlations are relatively inane. Um, and this, I can't quite read this particular one. It's, it's, it's I think, I feel depressed and I tend to have difficulty concentrating. I could have predicted that one. Um, but there are other ones that are less obvious. For example, um, our program was actually able to predict Marfan sy syndrome as a syndrome based upon the phenotypic uh, descriptions of, of Marfan's. That is, you know, a, a Marfan's patient would say, I have this and this and this and this, and they would cluster. Again, the statistical packages are quite good. And so the idea was that if only we could get access to this information. Well, one way we could get access, of course, was by answering questions. This is the interface. But what if, again, there were a variety of tests for a variety of conditions, and you uploaded the results of your tests, and you began to cert you'd certainly interface with your physician all you want, ask clinicians all you want, have healthcare providers help you out. But what if there was a community where you could say, who's like me? Is this statistically significant? Am I sick? Is this different? Is there really such a thing as a fatigue syndrome? What are the correlates of fatigue syndrome? All of these things, I think, are actually within our grasp. And so here's the final slide, more or less. What do I think the future looks like? We can make complex diagnostics now, and we can make them cheap and, for what, want of a better term, uploadable. Paper fluidics works. We're beginning to reduce it to the point where we think we can actually introduce it into, into the healthcare community. Complex analyses can be done in a relatively easy and online way. Um, again, it's a, it's a matter of, of social networks and statistical correlation. You talk about docs and doc in the box. I always like to think about house in the box. You know, what will be the, the ruthless diagnostic program that will tell me about my health status? And then finally, my dream is that people will take control of their own health care. And this is, a so, this is where there either is or is not a social revolution of warning. And I don't know. I mean, most of the time I think it's, you know, rainbows and unicorns sort of thing. But maybe people are ready to take control of their own health care, and we're ready to provide them with the technology to do so. And it's, again, the right congruence of technology and social revolution, just as it was back in the 70s when we had a major change in how we viewed women's health care. So with that, the folks that are responsible for the rainbows and unicorns at my end are Grace Eckhoff, a uh, brilliant Marshall Scholar now, Zi Chen, off to, be, off to be a Harvard Fellow, Bing Ling Lee, Sanchita Badra, and Peter Allen, I all mentioned. Matt Winkler and the Sturgeon um, Entrepreneurial Research Initiative with Jeff Taylor, John Jacob, and Oscar Ayala. Um, Dick Crooks and Karen, Karen's in the, Karen Skeeta's in the audience um, were funded by the NIH, the DARP, DARPA, and the Gates Foundation. And I, I love this because I'm funded for it, not the same work, but, but similar work, both by folks who are vastly interested in um, helping the world and folks who are vastly interested in making sure that we can defend the world as necessary. And so, but for both of them, it's the same problem. Are you sick in the field? We want to know, and we want to know fast. So, and of course, the great state of Texas, I am a state employee. I am one of the confluences that come together at this university. And it, you come here because of me. You come here because of Grace. You come here because of Z. You come here because we're Texas. And it is a little different than the online community, and it is worth dealing with. Thank you very much.